Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, serve under your chairmanship. I'd like to uh, pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Chingford and, and Woodford Green, who gave uh, such a powerful speech uh, today, uh, really calling out the um, list of issues that there are around uh, the behaviour of the uh, Chinese Communist Party, whether it's Hong Kong, uh, what's happening in the Himalayas, the South China Sea, and I think that really set the stage for what has been uh, an excellent uh, debate today. I wanted to pay tribute as well to uh, my colleague, the honourable friend, my honourable friend for uh, Bristol East, who gave a powerful critique of the uh, Human Rights Action Plan, and I think demonstrated in what she said that our values are not for sale, that when it comes to uh, the constant debate there is between uh, trade priorities and human rights priorities, uh, really, that debate should not be existing at all because the priority is to stand up for our values, stand up for human rights. And, and as uh, the Honourable Gentleman for Orkney and Shetland so uh, rightly put it, if human rights don't matter in Tibet or Xinjiang or other parts of the world, then they end up not, not mattering here. This is a universal issue that affects all of us. The Honourable Member for Bath made that point uh, very clearly in terms of the ethnic and uh, cultural uh, survival of ways of life and diversity uh, uh, across uh, China. Um, the Honourable Member for East wor Working and Shorhan, who has done so much work and has been a leading voice on the issue uh, of Tibet for uh, so long, set out some very tangible and clear recommendations for uh, what we need to do to address these issues. The uh, Honourable Member for Congleton, uh, likewise, and uh, so many other contributions uh, today uh, that we unfortunately don't have enough time to, to go through in, in detail. I wanted to say really a, a few words about where uh, my party uh, sits on this issue and uh, it's absolutely clear that we are profoundly concerned uh, by the uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslim Muslims. We've repeatedly called on the government to take action on this issue and we're deeply troubled to hear that similar abuses of human rights are taking place in Tibet. Uh, the research sets out uh, some very, very disturbing uh, statistics. Half a million laborers over the first seven months of 2020. Uh, there's a strict military style management and enforced indoctrination and intrusive uh, surveillance of participants. And it's clear that the programs aim to reform Tibetan so-called cultural backwardness uh, through learning Mandarin and weakening uh, the way of life and the religious practices of the Tibetan people. Before I appeal, though, to the minister with some uh, specific recommendations, I wanted to say a few words on the wider context around the policies uh, and activities of the Chinese government. It is becoming increasingly clear that our interaction uh, as, as a United Kingdom uh, and the uh, interaction and engagement of the United Kingdom government, successive governments since 2010, I'm afraid have been uh, characterized by a, a sort of naivety and complacency, um, both domestically and abroad. Uh, in 2015, we saw, of course, the announcement by David Cameron and George Osborne of the so-called golden era of Sino-British relations based on the premise that we would open our markets to China and the Chinese government would reciprocate whilst gradually aligning with the international rules-based order and opening up to trade with the rest of the world. It was an approach that viewed the UK's relationship with China purely through an economic lens, turning a blind eye to human rights abuses in exchange for the naive and narrow promise of future economic benefit. But the reality is that the benefits of trade have remained largely unbalanced, a process actively encouraged by the Chinese state, which has facilitated the replication of intellectual property and the dumping of heavily subsidized products on European markets, leaving UK firms open to hostile takeovers and driving the UK to a trade deficit with China of around 20 billion pounds a year. Further still, the UK now has 229 supply chains dependent on China, 59 of which relate to our critical national infrastructure. Moreover, we're increasingly isolated on the global stage. Over the past decade, I'm afraid we've gained a global reputation 
as being alliance breakers when one of the great strengths of our country has traditionally been our role as alliance makers. And the UK's relative isolation has made it easier for President Xi to press ahead with the imposition of national security legislation in Hong Kong that's been met with international condemnation, the persecution of the Uyghur and Tibetan minorities, destabling actions in the South China Sea that are in violation of international law. To summarize, our supply chain dependence on China clearly constrains our ability to stand up for our national interest and for our national security. While this government's approach to international relations has hindered our ability to convene and lead an alliance of democracies to stand up for our values and interests, the golden era strategy was an unmitigated failure. And Britain alone is an agenda that this current government appears to be pursuing is not a strategy at all, it's a recipe for disaster. China respects strength, unity and consistency but we are in a position where we're starting to look weak, divided, and inconsistent, and that has to change. We need a fundamental reset in Sino-British relations and, indeed, in relations between China and the rest of the world. It's against this backdrop that we're to be debating Tibet, and our central message to the government is that expressions of outrage are not sufficient. Tangible action is required, and we recommend three initial responses. First, the scope of legislation that underpins the so-called Magnitsky sanctions must be broadened. And the senior Chinese Communist Party and Hong Kong executive officials who are clearly responsible for breaches of human rights in Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong must be added to the list. The rapidity of the government's recent decision to add senior Belarusian officials to the Magnitsky list was very welcome. But why then is it dragging its feet when it comes to the Chinese government officials? Second, we urge the UK government to revise its risk advisory for British companies that source goods and services from areas that may involve Tibetan forced labor. The vast majority of British companies want to do the right thing. They want to behave ethically, and the government must act to support them in doing so. And third, we support calls for the UK government to push for the appointment of a UN special rapporteur for the full and transparent investigation of forced labor and ethnic persecution in Xinjiang and Tibet. But the issue of genocide has been raised today, but of course, uh, in order for that to be classified as genocide, very clear and compelling proof and evidence is required. And the way to get that is through international action to get that special rapporteur, because otherwise we can't move forward, uh, really, in, the, in terms of the debate around genocide. I trust that the Minister has taken note of the strong views that have ex been expressed by honourable members from across the House this morning, and I am looking forward to his response to the specific points and recommendations that have been made. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. If the Minister could conclude his remarks, please, no later than 10.57.